<laughs> and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ursula O'Farrell and I'm a painter and today I'm so excited to be speaking with Dave Gita. Dave is a man with many hats, um, but primarily Dave has stepped forward to help me optimize my painting website through what's called FASO, Fine Art Studio Online. He's um, helped me bring my game to the 2022 era. And we're here to really talk about quite a few things. One, I'd like to talk about this idea of how technology has informed creativity through the ages. And I won't go too far back, but I will start with this idea of, you know, in 1841, when this American painter decided how to take wet paint and put it in a tube, it changed everything because it led to the advancement of in the later 1800s of the Impressionist period. So artists were suddenly able to come out of their studios and go out and do en plein air painting. So again, how technology informs creativity. The next example, because I'll give three, is in 1989 when the World Wide Web was born. It was born by um, a gentleman um, working out of CERN and in 1989, that then birthed from world, you know, the World Wide Web into social media. And I wonder if many of you know when Facebook was born. Well, I looked it up and it's February 2004. I'm going to skip now to 2020 when all of us were having a global pause known as COVID. So sometimes you take global happenings and technology and you work with what happens creatively? The reason I've invited Dave to come chat with me was because I wanted to talk about what he terms as the sovereign artist period. And it seems to dovetail so nicely with some of the spiritual work I've been tracking for decades. And that is to move into stepping into your own personal sovereignty, to owning that which you choose you want to do instead of looking outside for approval or outside for permission or, or even source. It's just moving more inward. So I'm a painter, but I'm also someone who loves to talk big picture around how technology and creativity help work with one another. So with that said, I'm turning it over to Dave because you'll find out he has some incredible stories to share. And they're always like chock full of incredible details. So get ready to take some notes. Hi, Dave. <laughs> wow. I don't know how to follow that intro up. I almost, uh, my head almost doesn't fit in the screen, but I appreciate all the kind words. And, uh, you know, and, and I would only, the only thing I'd add to that is just that in Ursula, I feel sort of the kindred spirit. I think she and I both look at, uh, you know, the role of art and the role of technology as being uh, not only inextricably intertwined, but at the same time, they are the engine of uh, evolution uh, in terms of, um, you know, not physical evolution, but evolution of our consciousness uh, as human beings and how we perceive ourselves and the world around us. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to talk about the sovereign uh, artist era. Uh, the important thing to note is that uh, that these things that we're going to be talking about today, art, technology, um, they've been the drivers of every uh, advancement in uh, the human condition uh, in, in a positive way. And, and there are plenty of examples of negative ways. But when you combine art and technology together, it, uh, it, uh, it uniquely drives positive change uh, throughout society, societies. Uh, and it's not limited to any particular society, but uh, the one we're gonna focus on is the one that we live in, which is Western civilization. Um, and you can actually, uh, starting with the Middle Ages, track through four different eras um, that all combined uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to actually evolve the, uh, you know, our, our sense of our place in the world. And our, sen and, and our sense of what purpose means uh, as, as an individual and as a society. 
Um, and the first era that I'd like to talk about uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is, is uh, one that was deeply rooted in the Catholic Church, right? So if you, th so if you think about, um, you know, art in the Middle Ages uh, and, you know, shortly thereafter, you'll, you'll note that if you wanted to become an artist and you wanted to live off of the art that you created, uh, there was literally only one patron <laughs> that, you could, right. that you could hope to work for, which was the Catholic Church. Uh, and because the Catholic Church had that sort of, you know, grip on not only society uh, uh, across Europe and uh, and across much of, uh, you know, much of uh, the Middle East uh, as well and Northern Africa, um, they also, um, you know, could dictate uh, the types, the type of art that was created, right? So if you're an artist and, and you were fortunate enough to get the church to become your patron, um, they would tell you what to paint, right? And you didn't really have a choice. And, uh, and most of the time you were painting, you know, uh, murals in churches. And, uh, you know, and the epitome of what we're talking about is, uh, for example, this, uh, Michelangelo in the 16th chapel, right? Uh, I think that's what we all think about when we think of the Catholic church, you know, being a patron of an artist. Um, then uh, an interesting shift happened that correlated uh, with uh, not only changes that were occurring in art, but also uh, changes that were occurring, you know, in technology and its application that led to a dramatic shift in power away from the church and to the aristocracy. Um, and what I'm specifically referring to um, is uh, the printing press. So the printing press, which was the tool that empowered the church, because uh, three guesses, Ursula, what was the first book that was ever printed on the printing press? Um, let me guess, the Gutenberg Bible? There you go, <laughs> right? Uh, and so the Gutenberg Bi Bible was the first, and to this day, the Bible remains the most printed work uh, in the world. And it's been translated in every language known to man and woman. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, that same tool that empowered the, the Catholic Church um, also empowered uh, others. And specifically, we start to see a transition both in terms of art and the use of this technology uh, away from the church and, uh, and to what we would um, traditionally called humanism, right? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, and the epitome of this particular uh, era in art um, is the Renaissance in Venice. But, but it starts with the aristocracy um, who uh, began to take power away from the Catholic Church. Uh, so kings used to do whatever the Pope used to tell them to do, right? Because <laughs> if they didn't, they'd get in a lot of trouble because the Pope had his own army and his army was larger than everybody else's army. Uh, but then with Henry VIII, um, you start, to, and Henry VII and Henry VIII, you start to see uh, the formation of a separate church, a rebellion against the Catholic Church, uh, power shifting from the church to individual monarchs in individual countries, uh, and, uh, and the people that serve them in the aristocracy. Uh, and then those folks started becoming the patrons for, for artists, okay? But art actually led that transition, right? So again, I'll, I'll harken back to that example of uh, the Sistine's Chapel. Um, if you look at a lot of Michelangelo's work, um, it is uh, subtly subversive. The things that he paints, yeah, he, it, it, it's sort of like he paid attention to the letter of what he was being asked to do by the church, right? Uh, but at the same time, he introduced subversive themes into his art that uh, the church fathers weren't aware of, but people in the know, um, you know, who didn't agree with church doctrine, uh, especially around, uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the spread of information and knowledge and also, um, you know, the, uh, you know, greater freedoms uh, you know, for uh, indirect access to God, you know, because that, that was a central theme of this shift as well, is uh, the Catholic Church owned the relationship with God, and it was through the church that you actually, you know, had access to God and, and had access to 
uh, Christian notions of the afterlife. Um, but then that shifted to individual ownership over your relationship with God, right? Uh, and, and all of that was brought about by these, you know, very subtle, subversive uh, techniques and approaches and subjects and themes and applications of art and, uh, and even things as subtle as perspective um, uh, that, uh, that wove their way into the art of the time uh, and led to this shift uh, along with other historical factors. Um, uh, and then, and so what that meant for an artist was that suddenly instead of having one patron, you literally had dozens, maybe hundreds of patrons that you could, uh, you know, that you could seek out. Uh, but again, um, those patrons still dictated what was painted. Okay. It's just that you had the choice of hopefully finding a patron that was more aligned with your worldview and what you wanted to create. Um, as opposed to being forced to go with the only game in town. Um, now, uh, another shift occurred during this period where, um, where power shifted from uh, the aristocracy to the rising merchant class, right? And, uh, and obviously the, the, you know, the example we all think about when we think about you know, the height of this humanist period um, is the Renaissance in Venice, right? Where you had these wealthy merchants uh, that suddenly, you know, had power because they had money, uh, money that monarchs desperately needed uh, because uh, most monarchs weren't great business people, <laughs> right? Uh, and, they, and, they, and to be a monarch required a lot of money uh, and not, uh, you know, and not always, and money wasn't, and cash flow was always a problem when you were a monarch, right? You never knew when a war was going to hit. Uh, and so money lenders and merchants started becoming, um, the, the central power. Uh, and for them, uh, it was all about outdoing one another, right? Uh, so merchants, you know, just like the aristocracy before them, just like the priesthood before them, had this sense of community, right? And they understood who their peers were. And there was always this jostling for position within their peer group. And that's why, for example, if you walk down any street in Venice, um, you can tell how old the houses are on a particular street by how big and ornate they are, right? So the first merchant to move into the street usually had that first one story house that didn't look all that special from the outside. And then every subsequent merchant on that street built a house that was bigger, more ornate than the merchant that came before them. Uh, and until you get to these homes that are, you know, three and four stories uh, tall with uh, intricate ornate facades. Um, and, uh, and understand that that actually represented the, the height of architecture at the time. Uh, the idea uh, you know, during the Renaissance that there would be a building that a person would live in that was more than one story tall um, would have been mind blowing to somebody in the Middle Ages. The only buildings that were that large were churches, but suddenly you have these wealthy merchants and then also an explosion in patrons because where before you might've had, you know, hundreds of aristocrats to choose from, uh, suddenly you have thousands of merchants that you can choose from to become your patrons, um, all with wildly, you know, uh, uh, wildly varying perspectives on the type of art that they wanted to create, uh, granted all with an eye towards, you know, beating out, you know, uh, another merchant, right, by having better, you know, more meaningful uh, art to hang on their walls. And, uh, but, but again, the merchants still controlled the type of art that got created and the access to that art, okay? Because uh, you could only see that art if you went, if you were a friend of theirs, right? Or a guest and were in their home and were fortunate enough for them to share that piece with, with you. Um, now, the next shift occurs, um, it, you know, uh, after uh, the rise uh, of the merchant class and when we start to see the explosion uh, that occurred during the industrial revolution. And here we see a shift away from the merchant class, away from uh, you know, you know, these individual moneyed people controlling art to a period in history where um, art is uh, largely controlled by institutions. Uh, and those institutions range from uh, you know, art academies and museums and their associated exhibits, 
um, all the way through to, uh, to individual art galleries. Okay? And again, when, when, when that occurred, there was uh, a, a dramatic increase in terms of uh, the number of, you know, uh, I'm using air quotes here, patrons for art, right? Uh, uh, if I can use that term loosely, uh, but, but still the art and the type of art that was created um, was, uh, you know, was controlled by a minority of people uh, and access to the artist was controlled by a minority of people. Uh, and so I can't think of any better example than uh, the French Academy and their yearly salon show, the salon exhibit. Uh, and you mentioned Monet earlier, uh, Ursula. Uh, and, uh, and, and Monet and his, uh, and his contemporaries were not just revolutionary in terms of, um, you know, their approach to art, right? Because during that period of time, the gatekeepers, if you will, uh, the folks that decided who got into the big, you know, into the salon show every year, um, were uh, largely promoting uh, classical and neoclassical uh, types of art, right? Uh, and, uh, and that's what they considered art. And they had a very strictly defined codex of what type, you know, what constituted art, which was largely that uh, that form of artistic expression. Um, Monet and his contemporaries were rebelling against that through the Impressionist movement. Uh, and uh, they, for the life of them, for the most part, couldn't get into the salon. Uh, there was one artist in that group that did. Uh, the problem is that <laughs> the salon, the salon is, it, and I'm chuckling here because I think this is funny, a funny analogy, but uh, the salon to a large degree was sort of like uh, a supermarket, right? Uh, it was this big open area. Uh, it was literally, you know, stories tall. I think it was five stories tall, if I, if I recall correctly. And just like you had uh, shelves in a grocery store, the right. art, the art was arranged around the walls, right? Uh, and uh, and so you had art that was at floor level. You had art that was above that, and you had art that was above that, and art that was above that, and art that was above that, all ringed around the inside walls of this huge open uh, space. And, uh, and just like in a supermarket, um, there was premium shelf space, which was at eye level, right, where people were walking. And then the higher your art was placed in the salon, um, you know, the, the less likely you were to sell, right? And, uh, and, and if you were in the rafters up, up at the top of the salon, uh, there, was all, you know, there, was, there was also this connotation of your art was, wasn't good enough to make it to the first floor, so that's why you were up, you know, up up near the rafters. Um, and so, what were artists like Monet and his counterparts to do, right? Because they were not going to accommodate their style uh, based on the salon's rules. As a matter of fact, they were re rebelling against that. So, um, so they were the first artists to actually uh, say, you know, why don't we why don't we throw uh, our own exhibit? Uh, where we'll promote our art collectively as artists. And together we'll pool our resources, we'll rent a space, and we'll invite everybody that we know that agrees with our way of thinking, uh, in, in, and, uh, and specifically all the intelligentsia, all the elite intellectuals uh, that were also part of this movement, um, to it. And, and so it'll just be us and we'll sell our art. And I'm sure we'll do better than we would if we had all gotten into the salon and were up in the rafters. And they did. Uh, they actually sold more art through their exhibit than, uh, you know, even the artists that were on the first floor of the salon show sold. Okay, it's the classic case of being big fish in a small pond. And didn't they call themselves um, the salon des refusés? The yeah. refusés, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and it was a form of rebellion. Um, and, uh, and think about that. Uh, think about this period in time that we're talking about where the world is dramatically shifting because uh, it's at the, the, the very cusp of the industrial revolution. Um, you know, it, it predates actual revolutions that are about to occur <laughs> throughout the world, right? And continue to occur throughout the world. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, they were well ahead of their time, right? Uh, I mean, you fast forward to today, 
I'm sure we can all come, come up with dozens of examples of artists who essentially did the same thing, right? Uh, I call them co-op artists, right? Because collectively they come together much like a co-op, mm -hmm. uh, like an apartment co-op or a condo co-op. Uh, and they share in all the expenses for an event or an exhibit. Uh, they may actually even present themselves as a gallery uh, where they exclusively show their art uh, and share in the costs in doing all of that. Um, you know, and we would all think that that was a modern sort of, you know, thing, right? Part of this later movement we're going to talk about, the Sovereign Artists era. But no, um, when, you know, Monet and his contemporaries were the first to actually do this. Um, and, uh, and one way to think about it is uh, and why Monet and that particular group of artists um, are so important is because they lit the fire, okay? At that point, you know, from then on, things were radically different um, because um, the power of the small number of uh, institutional patrons um, suddenly shifted to a plethora of individual galleries, right? So here we see an explosion of what we call the gallery era, um, where individuals, uh, sometimes artists themselves, were uh, running their own societies and associations and opening up their own galleries and presenting a number of different artists. Um, and, uh, and so, you, you know, we also we shift from a time where maybe you had thousands of patrons to suddenly where you had tens of thousands of patrons, uh, you know, that could help you sell your art. Um, uh, but again, the, the, the model for, uh, for access um, was still the same, right? You still had gatekeepers that controlled access to the art and controlled access to the artist. Um, it's just that there were, you know, even more of them around. So uh, your average artist was bound to find, you know, a gallery or two or three that would be willing to represent them. Um, and this whole model was predicated on uh, both uh, the galleries and the artists behaving in certain ways, right? So for example, uh, at the beginning of this period, the idea of an artist, um, you know, going with another gallery was anathema, right? It was not done, it was taboo, right? Uh, you, you get to the middle of the 20th century and suddenly it's okay for an artist to be represented by multiple galleries, uh, but unthinkable that an artist would sell their art directly themselves, okay? Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if an artist did that, they would get blacklisted, right? And, and no gallery would touch them. Uh, and then you fast forward to the end of this gallery era when we start to see uh, a mix of these things, right? Uh, and this represents the leading edge of what we call the sovereign artist era. Uh, it's a period where um, changes in, in uh, not only societal behavior, but also um, individual behavior of the people buying art um, is shifting and then dramatically accelerating due to technology. Um, it's all in line with um, the shift that we're seeing uh, in society itself, right? As it's largely driven by the art that's being created. Um, and, uh, and it's one that, um, you know, is, is both exciting for artists, but at the, but at the same time, incredibly uh, scary, right? Uh, because it's a period where um, artists finally can have complete control over the type of art that they create. Um, and, they, and, they, and they have that control because technologies like the internet, technologies like social media platforms, um, have made it so that they can find their market anywhere in the world uh, without leaving their studio. Uh, but it requires the artist to market and sell their art themselves um, because collectors have changed, uh, you know, and, and I, I love the example of social media, right? So before social media, the idea that you would have a direct and personal relationship with an A-list, say, movie star uh, was unthinkable, right? Uh, and again, you fast forward to today, and we take for granted the fact that, you know, Artists and, uh, and influencers in our society, I use air quotes here because one of the 
you know, you know, one of the classic examples that come to mind, especially on Instagram, is uh, Kim Kardashian, right? Uh, and I think that you know, a person today could feel like they have a personal relationship with Kim Kardashian, uh, and this feeling of direct connection to these famous people um, is being driven by the platform, right? Uh, and and the the illusion, because it is an illusion. At the end of the day, uh, Kim Kardashian, you know, doesn't know ninety nine point nine nine percent of you know her followers, right? But she's able to create a presence and able to interact with those people at scale thanks to this platform in a way that makes them feel like she's talking to them, makes them feel like she's acknowledging them. Um, and uh, the other example of this I like to use for those of us that uh, predate these platforms, like me, like you, Ursula, um, is, uh, is the backstage pass at a music concert, right? That, pre that predate, it predates, you know, it's been, been around forever, right? I mean, they've had backstage passes since the, since the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Um, and why do people buy backstage passes? Have you ever, have you ever thought about that, Ursula? Just trying to get close to celebrity. Um. Uh, well, yeah, because we, we have this curiosity about the creative process, yeah. right? Yeah. As human beings, uh, and it's not just about art, but, but we're intensely curious about how the sausage is made, right? That's why we love, you know, reality, you know, reality shows that center around famous people and even not so famous people because it gives us these, this illusion, this feeling that we're seeing how the sausage is made, right? Uh, I hope my wife won't kill me when I say this, but one of her guilty pleasures is uh, she watches those housewife shows on Bravo. So Housewives of Beverly Hills, Housewives of New York. And she's a very intelligent woman and she knows that all this stuff is fake and choreographed, um, but it's, still incredibly entertaining because it gives you this illusion of, wow, you're seeing how these people, you know, these, these people that are extremely rich, you know, and extremely powerful and extremely famous, um, how they're just like normal, fallible humans like we are. And it makes us feel better about our circumstances, right? Because uh, let's face it, none of us have had, or well, at least most of us have never had you know, a dear friend flip a table over on us and spill wine in our face, right? Um, and uh, and it's the same, it's the same uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, behavioral uh, uh, impulses, right? Uh, basically our reaction to stimuli that drives this, you know, excitement around the backstage pass because we get to see what's going on behind the scenes, right? Uh, along with what you mentioned, uh, Ursula, was this, with this feeling that I could, you know, I can have a conversation with this artist, right? I can be backstage and then say hi. In fact, as part of my backstage pass, they're required to talk to me and take a picture with me, right? <laughs> and answer a few of my questions, uh, even if they don't want to. And I don't care because I, I, you know, I get to live this fantasy of mine of being a part of the band, right? Uh, by being backstage. And uh, and so all of what I've just described has dramatically impacted the way that um, collectors behave online. Because at the end of the day, collectors, um, you know, if artists drive the art, collectors drive the way that art is purchased, right? And, uh, and collectors today expect to have a direct personal behavior, I'm sorry, a personal relationship with the artists that they buy art from, at least the type of collector that you want, right? Uh, and and, uh, and it's important to make a clear distinction here. I think, uh, you know, uh, for years we've all heard and some people have said that the best type of collector is the investor, right? Because uh, if an investor buys your art, then suddenly all these other investors want to buy your art. Um, and the reality of uh, the investor collector is that they're the worst type of collector to have. Because when they buy your art, you know, they don't hang it up in their home yeah, or in their it. office. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you, I think you know where they stick it, Ursula. Do you, do you know where they stick all this art? Probably storage. 
uh, uh, for a commodity yeah, but, level, you know, waiting yeah, for so, it to go big in case you die. And then let's say, yeah, you're exactly, really, exactly. Exactly. There are literally um, museums do where, that too. Yeah, exactly. There are Entry, uh, and they're considered tax-free zones. Like the items in that in those special warehouses don't get taxed until they leave that area. And so investors basically never unpack that art that they buy. Right. Uh, they just stick them in those warehouses, uh, you know, until they're ready to sell them. If they sell them, and it leaves the warehouse. Then you know. Uh, the proceeds from the sales go to pay those taxes, right? It's a great, uh, it's a great racket uh, yeah. if you're part of the ultra wealthy that, that buy art this way and think about art this way. The problem is uh, nobody sees your art and chances are the next person that's going to buy that piece is another investor. And so your artwork basically is frozen in time somewhere in some nameless shadow, you know, shadowy warehouse that nobody gets to see. Um, until eventually maybe a museum buys it 100 years from now, uh, if you happen to, be, to, to, to make it. Uh, it puts it in their you, storage too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and both the museum, unfortunately, and these investor collectors, uh, they all want the same thing. They want you to create as few pieces as possible and to die as quickly as you can. Uh, make, so that after making it big, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You have just walked uh, us through like 500 years of, mm -hmm. um, you know, or more of, of art marketing through the ages and how technology and society um, and world events shape um, the market. So we're all sitting now in this place of 2022. There's mm -hmm. COVID still happening. But the blessing really was the pause to say, okay, I'm home. Um, I was in 11 art galleries nationally at one point. I've been fortunate to have had representation, but now the galleries themselves are being forced to close either because of rent going way beyond or the collectors aren't coming in to their physical space. So we're seeing a big paradigm shift Dave, around um, how to bring your creativity to market. And this is why I think that sovereign artist um, phrase that you and Clint Watson are talking about really rang a bell in me. And I'm hoping your story, and um, because I want to move towards solutions and how you work as a platform optimizer, supporting artists and encouraging us to get ourselves in a place of instead of waiting to be discovered or waiting for the gallery to say yes, the fewer galleries that there are, um, I, I'm gonna turn the mic back over to you because it's looking at, we're here now in the present, how do we go forward, especially with any creatives out there by going, um, I'm still waiting to be discovered, but no one's knocking on the door or calling. Sure. Um, and, and actually, if, if I can just say one thing before we get into that really quickly, is that um, this place in time that we're in right now is uh, the end of um, sort of a cycle that began in 1999. Uh, so the, do you recall the big thing that happened in 1999? Was the, that... Thing that shook, the thing that shook the world financially. <laughs> Well, I remember we were all afraid that when the year 2000 hit. <laughs> yeah, well, there was, there was Y2K, absolutely. Okay, but we had. Uh, but, well, in, we had but, the, in 19, but in 1999, uh, that time, there was this enormous bubble around companies whose business models were predicated on the internet, right? Uh, because that was the next big new thing, right? Everybody was talking about how the internet was going to revolutionize everything from, you know, uh, buying books, right? So you think of Amazon back in the day. That was oh, yeah, what they did. Online, they, online. Right? Um, but but uh, like most speculative bu bubbles, investors started getting a little too free with their investments. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm kind of showing my age here, but uh, I was career 
Uh, and before helping artists out, I, I spent uh, 20 years, 20 some odd years, uh, working exclusively at technology companies, helping them market and sell their art, uh, their, I'm sorry, oh. their software, not their art. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and so there were crazy things going on. Like people were literally putting, you know, the letter, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, E or I in front of a word. And suddenly, uh, and that was it. And that was it, right? It was I like, uh, that. yeah, I bananas. I uh, design. Or, <laughs> or I design or, oh my God. Uh, you know, and, 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 and people were going, you know, nuts. They were just throwing money at these people without these people even showing them a business plan, right? Uh, because the thought was, if you sprinkle enough of your money around, and even and and and, and the, the less you understood the company, the more likely it was going to hit it big, right? Because we're talking about disruption. Uh, and then and then and so what happened is you had these um, these very very young CEOs. it was paper rich right uh but that paper richness uh along with some actual money um you know they became the core of the growth of uh art sales in the late 90s uh and then when the dot-com bubble burst uh, that's when we see the first sort of shrinkage uh uh and collapse of the gallery uh market right we see our first significant number of galleries you know, just closing shop because the patrons that they used to rely on, well, now they're waiting tables in restaurants and working at Starbucks and can't afford art anymore. Um, and uh, the shocks that follow that. The next one was the real estate bubble in 2008, which again, that bubble uh, generated uh, an increase in art sales. Uh, we see, again, uh, not to the levels of 1999, but we see a number of galleries opening up uh, and starting up. And then once the bubble collapsed, um, there were fewer left after uh, the bubble collapsed than were around after the bubble in 1999 collapsed. Uh, and then you fast forward to COVID. And then that was the you know, the final nail in the coffin for two reasons. Um, like you mentioned earlier, uh, galleries had to shut down, right? Because they weren't allowed to operate, right? People could meet in person for a very long period of time in a lot of very important areas of the country. Um, you know, one of the most, you know, one of the earliest uh, markets in, uh, in North America to be hit by this was the West Coast. Uh, if you remember San Francisco, uh, which again is a center of technology wealth, and states like Washington and Oregon um, were the first to be hit by the first massive wave of COVID in the U.S. Uh, the second uh, market to be hit was New York, uh -huh. right, which is considered the center of art, you know, in the northern uh, in the northern hemisphere. Right, um, and uh, and so. And, and this also coincided, by the way, with a lot of those gallery owners uh, reaching retirement age. So you put that all together and, uh, and coming out of COVID now, what we're seeing is the number of viable galleries is minuscule by comparison to those that operated before 1999. Right. In fact, if I could just add, you know, um, being in the art scene, um, many galleries started going to these international art fairs. So if people weren't coming to them, they were congregating at, you know, art fair in New York or Soho or, but, but even that with COVID coming, you couldn't congregate. So the way to sell was um, still the old fashioned, here's the original work of art. I go to the gallery or I go to an international art fair or the Venice Biennale, right? If you make it big there, but that paradigm stopped in its tracks with COVID. Yeah, and, and the other scary thing, right, because here's the thing, every transition like this, every disruption in human society, um, uh, you know, the people, the institutions that were in power predating those disruptions uh, typically are, 
are the ones that die out because they can't adapt and can't change, right? So, uh, so for example, uh, an easy thing for any gallery or any art festival to do, and, and some tried, right? They just weren't very successful at it, um, was to take what they were doing and, uh, you know, and, and do it online, right? Because uh, one gift that COVID did give all of us is that uh, collectors and most everybody else in the art world who had never heard of Zoom right. suddenly were all Zooming because oh. that's the only way they could interact with people, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so it shocks me to this day, but it shouldn't really, right? Because uh, all we're doing is repeating history in, uh, you know, here is, uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't adapt to this disruption and kept waiting it out or, 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 or did half-hearted feeble attempts at leveraging the technology of the internet to reach their traditional audience. And, um, and, and that left room for this wonderful, uh, I call him the cabal, <laughs> right? Uh, the leading edge of the sovereign artist movement, these amazing artists who said, you know, I don't need you. Like, yeah, it'd be lovely to work with you for sure, but um, I am going to adopt these technologies because I feel comfortable with them. And I am going to attract my own audience of followers and patrons uh, who will then buy their art directly from me. And I'll take my cue from all these social media influencers. Um, and I will present myself to them uh, and, and foster in them the sense that we have a direct relationship. Even though I may have you know, hundreds and thousands of people that I'm connecting with in this way. Uh, and it's been amazing to see. It's been amazing to see all these artists empowered and, uh, and their art validated. Uh, and, uh, and just the, the pure joy and, and, and you know, and, and uh, the pure look of joy and the freedom that they're experiencing right now is, uh, for someone like me, amazing to, to witness. Um, and you're, you're actually a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, oh. <laughs> well, can I just, I, I, I mean, let me just. I, I, I mean that, I mean that sincerely, right? Well, uh, I don't, and, I, if I could just interject real quick, you know, there's this, within that paradigm shift that you're, we're talking about, it feels like social media and um, working within the network and sharing your work online, it has leveled the playing field because in the traditional models, and I think you and I talked offline about the art elite and how to access that was so, it was a pyramid, right? You had to know someone who knew someone or had certain shows, like you have to be seen at the Whitney or be celebrated. Yeah, I, 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 by, I, I actually I actually jokingly think of it as a funnel. Okay, well, an inverted pyramid. Because <laughs> it, it feels that way, right? It feels like you're being the squeezed. Playing field now, right? because no one is saying that's good art or that's bad art. That what we're moved with the whole network or the global um, audience is saying is, do I relate to this or not? Do I have a feeling or emotion to this? Do I like this person or yeah. not? So which, the level which, of playing field has shifted. For yeah, everything. well, which in itself has always been the case. We've just not been aware of it as artists. No, uh, so and, I used to work so, in high tech, and I yeah. used to, I worked for a high tech company for seven years um, in PR. Mm -hmm. Now working with brand in the philanthropy department. So I got mm -hmm. to see the corporate high tech, uh, um, how that worked in Silicon Valley. But I've also worked at the museums like the San Jose Museum of Art. And I helped understand how international exhibits were brokered in the back rooms of New York's top art galleries. So I'm mm -hmm. hearing exactly what you're saying, but this whole social, media now has leveled everything, Dave. I mean, well, it's definitely, it's definitely leveled the playing field, but I think what's important for people to understand is that there is one thing that hasn't changed. And that is the way our brains work. Right? <laughs> Are you sure about, about that? Are you yeah, sure that those boosters I, I, haven't done something to nope, our brain? <laughs> nope, nope. Uh, see, okay, evolution. Tell me works. about the brain. Yeah, well, evolution works at a very slow, methodical pace and takes tens, hundreds, sometimes millions of years 
to generate uh, you know, an advancement that we can actually see and, and notice, right? Um, but the human brain works in certain ways. Um, and this has been consistent throughout all these eras that I've been talking about, okay? Um, and you've heard me say this before. Uh, there, there may be a, a bunch of folks in your audience who've not heard me or, or know me or never heard anybody say this, but um, collectors throughout the ages, whether it was the church or the aristocracy or, you know, all the way up to collectors who buy today. Um, collectors don't buy art. And when I say that, people look at me funny, right? You know, collectors don't buy art. Uh, I mean, technically they do, but, but they're actually not buying the art. What they're buying is the story of the artist and the story uh, about that piece and the narrative that the piece is, uh, is telling, right? Because uh, every visual uh, work of art, just like the written work of art, is telling a narrative, right? It's framing a narrative. Um, you know, by the way, one of the reasons why I absolutely adore and love the visual arts is because uh, it is um, the only medium of art that I'm aware of Aside from, you know, going to a Queen concert, <laughs> right, uh, that is uh, what I call co-creative, right? Uh, because you as the artist have a, a story and a range of emotions that you are trying uh, to express through your art, right? Uh, and along with, so, so in essence, it's telling a story. And, uh, and then the viewer of that art is taking that and melding it with their own stories and actually co-creating a narrative that you know that connects them to the to the artist through this work. Um, and you don't see that in a written language unless you're you've got one of those pick your own adventure books, right? Uh, and you don't see that in music. I use Queen as an example because they were one of the first bands, for example, that would get their audience to sing the lyrics of songs, right? Uh, yeah. The choruses. Interactive. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was interactive. And, um, and so, um, you know, going back to how the brain works is uh, since the dawn of humans being humans, the way we, we make sense of the world is through narrative. Right, so our brain's taking all of this stimuli around us, and believe me, there's a ton of stimuli that you know, bombard us every second of every day, uh, and and it does its best to look at you know pay attention to the stimuli that's the most important to our to our survival, and then try to make some sense out of it by creating a narrative. Okay, uh, and so collectors don't buy art; they buy the stories of the artists and they buy the story of the pieces and the story that the pieces themselves are trying to express. Um, and specifically the stories that make them feel good about the story they believe about themselves and the story that they believe about, um, you know, how the world works or should work, okay? Um, there's, uh, there's a term in behavioral science and neuroscience I don't remember. Oh, I froze for a minute. You said yeah, there's you a term in behavioral science? Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a term in behavioral science and, uh, and neuroscience called confirmation bias. Have you ever heard this one? It, it actually became part of popular culture uh, you know, during the last election cycle, right? Because Facebook as a platform is uh, an accelerant, if you will, to confirmation bias. So most of us think that the way that we make decisions uh, in, in the world is that we collect facts, we collect stimuli from our environment, uh, and then we weigh that stimuli, we run it through a process of cognitive analysis, and then we turn around and we make logical decisions based on the facts, okay? Um, the reality is that's not how we make decisions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We actually do it the other way around. We have these strongly held beliefs yeah. uh, that we cling to just like a sailor yeah. clings to a piece of wood after a yeah. shipwreck. Yeah. And yeah. then we cherry pick the facts yeah. and that support what we want to believe and we ignore the facts that undermine what we want to believe. Uh, and, and this makes us happy. 
<laughs> That's one of those um, Facebook algorithms, you know, when the computer can track what you've been looking at and just keep reinforcing and reinforcing um, what it monitors as you already looking at. And there's yeah, that movie that, called that's the, the Social that's Network. The, yeah. Yeah, that's that's just pretty scary. But uh, but what I'm talking about, and, and and again, this is why it became so important during the last political cycle, is that people on social media platforms like Facebook, they tend to follow people that reinforce their own beliefs mm -hmm. and align with their own beliefs, and they tend to shun, unfriend, unfollow people that challenge their beliefs. And so what that creates is sort of this echo chamber uh, where it's very difficult for reality to pierce, right? Because um, you're hearing what you want to hear. Uh, it, again, it's sort of like being a movie star, right? Movie stars are always surrounded by uh, psychophants that tell them what they want to hear. Uh, and so if you ever wonder, for example, why, uh, you know, a wonderful uh, actor uh, and I could pick from uh, a slew of them, but uh, you know, you take a look at an actor like Antonio Banderas, for example, right? Um, and early on in his career, before he became famous, before he had a circle of psychophants, uh, he had people surrounding him that you know actually shared what they thought, and uh, and so the movies that he was in and the movies he chose to be in uh, were great movies, where you know the roles were tailor made for him as an actor. Uh, and that's what made him famous. And then after he became famous, he started, you know, he was surrounded by psychophants that, you know, were telling him yes. So he would ask them questions and they'd go, yes, that, that's great. And so you start to see, you know, and Tara Banderas and other actors later in their career doing these atrocious movies, mm -hmm. right? And you just shake your head. on a detective show that was sort of new and unique. And, and the premise was awesome. It was all about this uh, Hollywood actress who bought a detective agency as a tax shelter, right? Uh, and then her, uh, her uh, accountant ran off with all of her money and all she had left was this detective agency. And Bruce Willis was the star, Sybil Shepherd was playing the actress that lost their money and they became a detective team. And it was a wonderfully, for the time, inventive and entertaining and creative show. And he went on to, to do some amazing movies early on in his career. Uh, and, uh, you know, I challenge you to go take a look at his profile on IMDb today. And you'll see, uh, these, you, know, you know, these last 10 years is, uh, with, with a few notable exceptions, it's a train wreck of just more and more atrocious movies that we've never heard of that never made it into movie theaters, right? Never even made it to DVD. Just ended up on, the, you know, on the end. And um, uh, all of that, just to say that um, our, our brains work this way. Okay. And so collectors, um, uh, you know, don't buy art, they buy their stories. Uh, and and when they hang the art in their homes or in their offices, uh, for those collectors, uh, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the story that they want to believe about themselves and about how the world works. And so the artists that are succeeding in this era, the sovereign artist era, are the ones who are being brave. Because uh, you need to be brave to do this. Themselves out there right? Sharing their stories about their journey as an artist and, uh, you know, and the challenges and frustrations as well as the successes and the joys of creating their art, uh, you know, openly with their audience uh, and bringing them along for the ride. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's led to some artists that are, you know, doing that and being brave in that way, uh, generating much more income themselves through their own marketing and selling uh, on these platforms than they ever did through the gallery system. Okay, and, so that's a good... and, and you're and you're one of those artists. I know you don't like me to say that, but you well, are. I feel like you've um, helped optimize my website. But but let me just go down to so it's really three key points um, that you would give a helpful tip to any artist listening, whether they're painter, sculptor, some some commodity to sell. Um, be brave, share your story 
go online. What else would you add to that, Dave? Well, um, don't waste your time. Ah, what do you mean by that? List. Well, know. we, uh, you know, so <laughs> imagine, you're, imagine you're an artist. You just watched this amazing video, you know, uh, with Dave and Ursula on it. Yay! <laughs> and, and, so, uh, and so you're excited and you want to start doing this, right? Um, what most people and most artists do in that situation is they Google, right? They'll start trying to search for information about how to do whatever they think they should be doing, right? Like, so we've been talking a lot about Facebook and Instagram. So you may have an artist out there that says, okay, how do I market my art on Facebook, right? Or how do I market on Facebook? Uh, and they start entering queries like that in. Uh, and then what pops up are all these um, quote unquote experts, right? That are experts, uh, supposed experts in particular niches of marketing. In, in our example here, Facebook, okay? Um, and so they give you some advice. Now, the problem with the advice is that or creators or makers in general, uh, it was meant for people that exclusively market and sell products that they don't make, okay? And so, uh, for example, one, one of the most famous people that, uh, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, and he's a genius in his own way, in his own right, uh, you know, uh, so, so I'm not trying to detract from that, but uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Gary Vanderchuk. Have you ever heard of uh, Gary Vanderchuk, first of all? Um, no. So uh, Gary Vanderchuk was this guy that gained prominence in the late 2000s, early 2000s, uh, and he is one of the top uh, guys on the speaker circuit, right? Uh, so back, you know, when we had these big conferences and they invited speakers to come and talk, um, he gets paid a lot of money to do that. Uh, and his story begins uh, in all places, my home state, New Jersey, where his dad was running a wine, uh, you know, a wine store, right? So his dad uh, exclusively sold wine and he had this little shop in Jersey uh, and they were doing okay, but you know, they also had their struggles. And Gary, being a young guy, he was like 18 at the time. And again, this is like, uh, you know, right after the, the real estate bust, 2008. Um, he decides he's going to go on this new platform called YouTube that nobody's heard about, except for young kids his age. Uh, and he's going to create videos uh, that are all instructional in nature, right? Where he's teaching people, um, you know, what makes a good wine versus a bad wine and how to select the wine and how to pair wine with different types of food. Uh, and, uh, and more so than anything else, when you look at those early videos of Gary doing this for his dad's wine shop, um, he, uh, you know, he's just over, he's just one of these over the top enthusiastic guys. Now, but that's just who he is, right? So no matter what he's doing, no matter what he's talking about, whether it's good, bad, you know he is going to be energized and, and, uh, and just kind of like over the top emotional, uh, like he wears his heart on his sleeve. No matter what he's doing. Yeah. yeah, entertaining. And so uh, just like his family, just like his, because he comes from a long line of, you know, uh, folks that sell wine, um, he had a passion for wine. Right? It was in his DNA, it was in his blood. And so he, these videos are just chock full of him, of Gary being Gary, right? Um, and funny thing happened. Uh, they started selling more wine online than the store had sold. You know, in one year, they sold more, you know, more, more wine online than the store itself had sold in five years. Wow. All from this kid just doing YouTube videos talking about this stuff. Right, and then them setting up a store where people could actually buy the wine, uh, and so that led to his career as sort of uh, a guru for social media influencers. And for those of you who are not familiar with what an influencer is, um, they're somebody on Facebook or Instagram that amasses a huge audience uh, based on some interest of theirs. Okay, uh, and when I say a huge audience, we're talking, uh, you know. 
uh, to get into this game, you, you, you need at least 10,000 followers. Um, the average number of followers, usually numbers in the millions, okay? Uh, and the bigger the number uh, that you have, you know, the, uh, the more advertisers want to work with you. Uh, and it's a different model of working, right? So basically what they do is, um, you know, they, you know, these people that make products, right? They give you their products uh, related to your area of interest. And then, uh, and then you talk about them. And, uh, and you can be honest in your feedback. Like it's okay, for example, for you to say, yeah, they gave me this product and I wouldn't buy it, right? Uh, because of this, that, and the other thing. Because the funny thing is, even when an influencer tells you not to buy a product, people still buy the product because they're curious yeah. and they want to see the flaws, right? It's insane, right? Uh, but here's the thing about an influencer. An influencer does not make anything, right? All they do is they talk about the thing they're super into and they talk about these products, but they don't make anything, okay? Here's the other thing, right? So Gary Vanderchuk, who's like, the marketing guru to social media influencers. He says that the key to success is, you know, so basically if you wanna be an influencer, you better plan to spend the next five years of your life not making any money, working every day of the week, <laughs> posting on every social media platform, even new ones that nobody's ever heard of. You gotta be the first one on there. Yeah. And, you, and you have to be posting original content 20 times a day on each of those platforms for four to five years, right? Wow. Till you amass a following. And then the money starts rolling in, which allows you to hire people so that maybe you get a day off, <laughs> okay? Uh, and think about that. Think about, you know, you being an artist and you're Googling this and you see it and suddenly you go, oh, I have to be on all these social media platforms because Gary says so, and I have to post 20 times a day. Uh, if you're doing that, how the heck do you create art? You, you don't. Uh, and so that creates sort of a, a scenario that we call the making uh, marketing pendulum. And it goes something like this. An artist will you know, go through a period of creating a bunch of art till they're literally tripping over the inventory. And then they look around and go, yeah, and they raise their hand, right? And then they go, oh, I got to sell this. And so they do their internet research. They find some piece of advice, like, like the one I just described. Uh, and then they try it. The problem is doing it, there's a, there's a steep learning curve, um, and it eats up all your time. So you have to put your art away, uh, sometimes for six months, sometimes even for a year. Uh, and, and you get into marketing and selling mode. And here's the scary part, too. Um, you know, there are many, 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 many more uh, artists that try to do this and fail, don't sell a thing, or don't sell enough to actually live on, live off of, uh, and only a very small number of artists that this is successful for, okay? And if you're one of the successful ones, what happens is you start to run out of inventory, and you go, oh, crud. I need to stop marketing and selling now. And then I need to go back to creating art. And so you'll go off and you'll start creating art for another six, six months, 12 months, however long until you're again tripping over inventory. Okay. Uh, now the problem with this is twofold. One, um, there's a cost to something. And again, this, this is part of, of how our brains work. Um, neuroscientists and behavioral scientists call this context switching. Right? So whenever you're doing a task and then you switch over to do a completely different task, there's a cost associated with that because your brain essentially has to reset. It has to go, okay, I'm done doing this. I have to go back to doing that. And then it takes a certain amount of repetition and time before that other task becomes you know, a habit that you don't have to think about. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then when you switch back to the original task, the same thing happens right? Um, people would call this getting into your rhythm, okay? And so what happens is that type of an approach is ultimately destructive for artists. It burns them out because um, every time they switch context, there's a period of time where they have to get back into the flow of that particular task, whether it's creating or marketing, okay? Which takes time uh, and, and takes money, right? Yeah. Uh, the other problem with it 
uh, is the marketing side, right? Because the pace of marketing anything uh, and the changes that occur in uh, marketing online, uh, the pace of it's, you know, incredibly fast. Like uh, literally, uh, I do these courses every week where I teach artists uh, and they're free, right? You've, that's how you and I met actually. That's how I started. made it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's funny, I, I have to redo content related to Instagram and Facebook at least twice a year. Wow. Right? Oh, okay, so pause for just a minute. If someone's listening and they want to know how to access your free art marketing classes weekly. Oh, yeah, sure. I can... What, uh, what would that... Is there an email that they... Well, there's a website. I came through FASO, the Fine Art Studio online. I'm, mm -hmm. I've been a long yeah, time. So, yeah, so if... Uh, so, so one of the ways that you can do that is by visiting my site. Uh, it's called Dave Gita, the Art Marketer. Try, I try to keep things simple, Ursula. So, and you know, I don't want to come up with a uh, crazy well, fancy name. We'll try. Let's uh, spell Gita for people. G E A G E A D A. Yeah. And what and what you really have to and what you really have to remember is uh, the website URL, which is theartmarketer.com. There. Right? That's a lot easier. Uh, yeah, that's a lot easier. Uh, and then uh, all you need to do up here at the top of, the, of this menu is there's a, a link for uh, my free art marketing courses. It's right here. Awesome. Look at that. And, yeah, and you just click on that. Uh, and then you'll see uh, a listing of my upcoming free there you art are. marketing yeah. courses. And they happen every week. So, uh, so tomorrow, for example, today's Tuesday, tomorrow is mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday, and we'll be talking about um, how to create Instagram stories to grow your art sales. Okay? Uh, and we're at the tail end of, um, a, you know, of the Instagram portion of a series, of a broader series that I'm doing around uh, managing your time, right? Because that's one of the keys to success in the sovereign artist era is not wasting your time, and taking that, the time that you have to apply to marketing and selling your art, um, you know, and, and managing it effectively so that you don't feel overwhelmed, so that you don't feel like giving up. Um, and also, so, um, you know, and by the way, I should probably take a step back and say that all of this, the live courses that we teach, the consulting services that I offer for artists, the platform, FASO, um, that you're a member of that uh, we'll, we'll talk about here shortly as well. Um, they're all based on a, a, a proven formula for marketing and selling your art that I developed with my good friend, Clint Watson, who's the CEO of Fonso. Uh, it's called the uh, art marketing formula. And so we've spent the last decade working with artists like you, um, Ursula. Um, and this started out literally the first year I came to work at Fonso because uh, I used to be the chief marketing officer at FASO. Uh, today, I'm what they call the chief platform evangelist, uh, which means, uh, you know, I get to do what I love all the time, which is help artists, right, <laughs> by teaching yeah. them all this marketing stuff. And, uh, and I don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day marketing stuff anymore, which is a joy for me, right? Um, and, uh, and so this art market, these market and sell their art. And, um, and so uh, Bull Brush, which is the parent company, Faso is the product. Uh, it's a, a art marketing platform for visual artists. Uh, you know, they, they were my client at the time. And, oh. uh, and, so, uh, and so that first year, along with helping them improve their own marketing, um, people found out about me. They found out that, you know, artists that were on the platform found out that, oh, there's a marketing guy at Fonso now. Uh, I wonder if he can help me with my marketing. And so they would email me and ask if they could set up some time with me. Uh, and I would. And, uh, and so I started doing this with just a handful of artists that seemed the most interested. And, uh, and so, I, you know, and, and I thought I had it all figured out right? Because I had the successful key career in high-tech marketing. I was going to take my same toolkit with me, right? And apply it for them. Yeah. And, uh, and it was disastrous for them and for me, right? Because the things I was telling them to do, which were the things I would do when I, you know, as I was, you know, uh, as a chief marketing officer and a marketer, a technology company, wasn't working for them. 
because it was too complicated and it was too time consuming. And, uh, and it reinforced these, what I call self-destructive narratives that get in the way of a lot of artists' success in the sovereign artist era. Yeah. Uh, the one, this one being, um, I'm not great at technology. I'm an artist and artists aren't great at technology and I'm not great at technology. Right. And, uh, and when you tell yourself that story, you're undeniably uh, gonna fail. <laughs> right? yeah. uh, you have to believe in yourself before you can succeed. Uh, and so I really had to take a step back. And so those, you know, uh, I, you know, after like my first three to six months of the company, I said, I have to stop giving advice and I have to start listening and asking advice. And so I began to seek out artists on the platform who were um, sort of the folks on the leading edge of the sovereign artist era uh, and were incredibly successful um, in marketing and selling their own art. And, uh, and along with that, I also spoke to a lot of artists who were struggling right? We're almost at the end of just kind of throwing in the hat and giving up. And, and, and I'm not a genius here. I'm not Einstein. Uh, but if I have one advantage is that in that role, uh, and even in my role today, I get to talk to thousands and thousands of artists a year. And when you talk to that many artists, you begin to see patterns in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, and so I began to document those differences and then I began to run experiments with artists where we would implement you know, these things that were working for certain artists uh, and, uh, and apply them to artists you know, who were not successful in marketing and selling their art. I even worked with artists who were just at the very beginnings of their career, right? Had, you know, had just put together their first online portfolio and their first body of work. And so we're complete newbies, even to, even to the art scene. Um, and, and for about eight years, we ran these experiments and boiled it down to the specific you know, set of marketing activities that you should follow, that when followed and done correctly, um, you know, set you up to market and sell your art in less time, yeah. uh, actually help you grow your art sales, uh, even some, you know, in a lot of cases, more than at the height of some of these artists' gallery, you know, careers, right? Like you, where you had, you know, multiple galleries selling your art all the time. Uh, they were actually doing better marketing and selling the art themselves, doing it following this formula. And um, they had more time to create, not less time. Hmm. Uh, and so imagine me, you know, Come, you know, me and Clint working on this formula together, kind of like two laboratory, you know, two, uh, you know, two uh, mad professors in the laboratory uh, creating this Frankenstein monster uh, and, and then trying to convince artists to give it a try. Yeah. Um, and fortunately for us, uh, there are a lot of desperate artists out there who said, sign me up. I don't care what it is because right. everything else I tried isn't working. Well, if I could and, just... Let me just add real quick. Yeah, um, what, why I joined FASO is because I was that artist that didn't want to spend too much time doing tech, even though I had a little bit of a background in PR and marketing. But mm -hmm. FASO was easy to just learn how to upload a JPEG to a website that already had a template and you could choose from the many beautiful templates. It was like plug and play mm -hmm. compared to in those early days. Cause I came, I've been with FASO I think 16 years. And once it's set up, yeah. it's, you can modify, build, and you helped optimize my site. Um, but mm -hmm. if, if in closing, I would say, you know, if you're ever interested in coming back and we can have a little chat about the playbook, I think it would really help people understand or even just how to get to mm -hmm. your site. Um, because this is, this is the key message that you're saying. Be brave. Go online. Share your story. And don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean those are that's in in a nutshell. That's that, I know yeah. we're, we're running yeah, and, a little and, bit long, but I just thought, oh my well, god. It, hey. Well, Ursula, it's me. At the end of the day, you knew this was not going to be <laughs> on time. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I'm a talker. What can I tell you? But uh, oh, but I love I'm, it. Well, I'm passionate about what I do. Um, well, you got us through what, 500, 600 years of art history and marketing. And, and I'm wearing a pashmina from Florence, by the way. So I had that renaissance. I, I, 
I noticed. The Renaissance, because I lived in Florence for a year and in college. And so I just wow. thought, but you know, and then when you start doing interesting or unusual work, it's really, the narrative is going to be key, become even more key if it's art that people haven't seen before <laughs> or they don't know how to well, place yeah, it. Yeah, well, well, can, um, for next time, because I would definitely, I would definitely love to do oh, this next time. I'd love to go over the formula with your audience. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I'd thank also you. like to talk more about FASO, right? Because I think, um, you know, uh, you know, it's important for, you know, I'll, I'll just say this for now is that FASO is the only um, marketing platform out there. And by marketing platform, I mean a platform that, you know, provides you with a way to build and maintain your own artist website, a way for you to, um, to, uh, to market yourself um, through, because uh, it includes things like an email platform. Uh, and, and it's also the only platform out there, period, not just for artists, but period, that rewards artists for maintaining their website by automatically promoting whatever art-related products they have to sell right. um, just by virtue of the artist, you know, uploading a new, a new artwork, for example, or adding a print to their site or adding a new calendar to their site um, and, or a workshop, for example. But we'll get into that next week. Uh, okay. But the other thing I want to do, the other, uh, the other thing I want to do though, is I want to make sure that we tell your story. Right? Oh, because, well, we're going to have to save that for next time because I don't know yeah, how long it's going to take time, me to yeah, upload for next, this. For next time. But, but you, <laughs> it's going to take me like you, 24 no, hours to upload. No, it's, it's not because after this, I'm going to show you a really super Wi-Fi. easy way. <laughs> I've, I've got a super easy way for you to do this that will not be impacted by your Wi-Fi. So, so trust me on this. I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. Uh, but here's the thing. You, you got to, you know, the, your story is one that we have to share um, because it's the poster child for what we're talking about in the sovereign artist era, right? Okay, well, uh, and, no, and, those of you, and those of you that know Ursula and know her well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we'll, we'll tease this one, right? So if you really want to find out why Ursula is the poster child for all of this, um, you're going to have to tune in next time. Oh, you're making me blush. Okay, Dave. Dave Gita is the artmarketer.com. <laughs> so go find out how to listen to his Wednesday morning free, how to market your art, simple tools. It's, it's not only entertaining, it, it works. So thank you, Dave. Now, well, no, thank you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. And um, uh, and I hope your audience walked away with something of value today, or at least the beginning of, you know, because all of this is predicated on the artist changing their behavior, right? So hopefully this has opened your eyes to the possibility of doing things differently and doing it in such a way where you're in control of your own art career and the type of art that you create. Right? Wouldn't that be a wonderful world? Where you I wouldn't have to worry you know, about patrons? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you are, are a gem and I'll be getting on your schedule um, and we'll do another fun chat. Thanks, Dave. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs>